Looks like we got folks joining us from Seattle, Missouri, Michigan, LA. We got Japan represented, Pennsylvania. Oh, the Netherlands, wow. Got someone near uh, London, Philadelphia. Oh, Nigeria as well. Nice, uh, nice to see we've got a good international representation today. This is fantastic. Yeah, we're still slowly getting some people uh, logging in, so I'll give it just another moment before we get started. But uh, yeah, we'll wait, get this going in just a moment. Thank you again, everybody, everybody for joining us. This is, uh, this is very fantastic. We're happy to see you all here. Well, if the if the music is coming to an end, I suppose it's uh, probably a good enough a, a time as any to to get this started. So, everybody, thank you very much for joining. Uh, welcome to the Laurasian Institution Presents event, launch your Japan related career with Kashia of Ikigai Connections, and uh, we have a really great panel of speakers today. And so we definitely want to get into uh, get into that as as soon as we can. Um, let me introduce myself first. My name is Gabriel Rebeck. I'm Japan Programs Manager uh, with the Laurasian Institution. I'm also joined by Samantha Corpas, who's also here in the Seattle office. Samantha, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Sure. Um, it's hard to like see anyone right now because I'm also sharing my screen, but um, my name is Samantha Corpas. I work here in the uh, Laurasian Institution Seattle office. Um, I'm the program assistant, um, doing a myriad of things um, along with Gabriel in Seattle. It's very nice to uh, meet you all, and I uh, hope we, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy today's uh, presentations. Samantha will be taking; she'll be uh, the one taking the the questions a little bit later on. I'll, I'll get to that in just a moment, but that's why her name is uh, is Q and A. What is it? Q and A submissions, I believe. Uh, we also have Yume Hidaka, our program director, joining us from Tokyo. Yume, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, you may, you're, you're muted. There you go. I'm okay. All right. Sorry about that. Um, Ohayo gozaimasu or konbanwa. Uh, I'm Yume uh, from Tokyo office. Uh, thank you for joining us today and I hope you enjoy. Thank you so much, Yume. Yeah, it's not a Zoom event until somebody has started speaking while they're muted. So thanks for making that happen for us today. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to mention briefly who we are, Laurasian Institution. So we are hosting this event. We're really excited to have our, our speakers here, but uh, I wanted to mention specifically who we are before, uh, before we get too long into it. So uh, Laurasian Institution, we do uh, programs of academic and cultural exchange, specifically between the United States and Japan. Uh, we've partnered with both the US State Department and also the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs on a number of programs for nearly 30 years now. Um, some of our flagship programs include, uh, uh, I think the first one here is JOY program, yeah, the Japan Outreach Initiative, which is a program sponsored by the Japan Foundation uh, Center for Global Partnership, which places Japanese uh, cultural outreach coordinators around the United States to do uh, Japanese language and cultural outreach and sort of teach about Japan in areas of the United States that don't have much access to Japanese uh, programming already. Another one of our programs is the JLEAP or Japanese Language Education Assistant Program, which places Japanese, uh, Japanese nationals around the United States to do Japanese language education in uh, mostly K through 12 schools. Uh, they team teach with teachers here in the United States to, do, uh, to provide uh, native speaker Japanese language education to the students. And uh, that one's also dispatched all, the, all around the country. So we've got good represent, representation around the country on that too. Um, our uh, totally in-house program, uh, New Perspectives Japan, or NPJ, is a high school mainly focused on high school uh, students sending American students over to Japan for two-week uh, uh, programs every summer. And so that includes a lot of uh, a very robust curriculum of education, you know, talking about Japan and learning about Japan. The teachers can choose which uh, kind of subject they're going to focus on. And then uh, the students can uh, get over there and actually learn what they're, you know, see visually what they've what they've been learning about. But also there are homestays, and uh, it's really a life changing experience. 
Uh, we also have done, so the Tomodachi Initiative, you might be familiar with that. We've done Tomodachi SoftBank, Tomodachi Johnson Johnson, Tomodachi uh, Honda. We've done a number of those over the years, um, but we've also done, uh, so Kakehashi, Kizuna, we've done all sorts of projects uh, in collaboration with other groups to bring all sorts of uh, Japanese uh, cultural outreach, meaning both uh, US to Japan and Japan to the US as well. So uh, we're always looking for more avenues for programming and uh, providing Japanese language and cultural outreach around the United States and around the world indeed. So uh, if you're interested in programming, uh, get in touch with us. Uh, you can follow us on social media and, and see uh, information about further events such as this one the, in the Laurasian Institution Presents series. Um, but also find out some more about our, our, our bigger programs and uh, yeah, interact with us. We want to hear from you. Um, okay, so that leads us to the actual content of today's uh, presentation, um, the Japan-related career job search. Now, a lot of you joining us today might uh, maybe have already studied Japanese uh, to some extent or maybe majored in Japanese language or culture or something in, in university, and you want to know, where do I go from here? or perhaps you're a mid-career professional, you've got a, a strong interest in Japan or, or knowledge or something like that, and you want to figure out uh, something that you could do in your career that would be connected to Japan. And uh, there's, there's a lot more out there than you might realize. It's just a little bit hard to find it. So what we want to do today is help you get connected with that community that exists and uh, speak just a little bit about uh, how a couple of different people have made their way into that sort of uh, realm and, uh, and let them all sort of answer your questions and share some ideas. Now, when speaking about, uh, oh, and, and as far as, uh, uh, when we get to the point of sharing questions, um, so, so first we're gonna hear from Kasha of Ikigai Connections. She's gonna speak a little bit about the job search, give some advice, uh, and then we're gonna introduce our panel. Our panel is going to sh uh, share some information about kind of how they got into their careers, but also they would love to answer your questions. So between now and the time we open up that, uh, that Q&A session, I invite you to share any questions that you might have in a direct message with the Q&A submission member. That's again, Samantha here in our office. She's, uh, she's gonna be uh, taking a look at those messages as they come in and we'll try to uh, answer as many as we can get to. So how you do that is uh, just in the, in the chat in the bottom right. If you change the two, there should be a little button that says two, just find Q&A submission type your message into there and uh, we should get it on our side. Um, and then uh, the other exciting thing that I wanted to mention is that there will be a door prize at the end. So five people will receive a one month free membership to SAIL, the Japanese language conversation platform. Shingo Ono, our representative from SAIL is going to explain the platform, kind of how it works just a little bit. Uh, and then we'll pull five random numbers uh, at the end and, and give those out to five lucky individuals. You have to be in attendance to win the door prize. So everybody stick with us. Um, yeah, I guess without any further ado, I would like to introduce uh, our, our first speaker, Kasha of Ikigai Connections. Now, when speaking about the job search, uh, the Japan related job search, Kasha's name is the first one that comes to my mind. She is super passionate about helping people find their Ikigai. So Kasha is a trilingual American who spent eight years in Japan, including high school, college, graduate school, and the start of her professional career. She earned a bachelor's degree from Boston University and a master's from Tokyo's Ochanomizu University. Uh, her career utilizing Japanese language and cultural skills began in 2003 with concert promotion and later moved to interp interpretation and translation um, for the electronics and automotive industries. Uh, this career spanned her living in Japan, Poland, Italy, and the U.S. So again, very international. Um, now she shares her passion for finding uh, people's Ikigai through Ikigai Connections, an online research and job board helping professionals find career paths in line with their personal goals. Kasha will speak for a little while about searching for work, and then we'll bring in our other amazing panelists for additional uh, discussion and questions and answers. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Kasha of Ikigai Connections. Hello, everybody. This is so exciting. There are so many people here. Thank you so much for joining. And I see some very familiar names, so really appreciate this. I hope that uh, you get a little bit of energy, motivation, especially with the panelists. Oh my gosh, it'll just be amazing. Um, I hope it'll be some inspiration. So, 
regardless of where you are at in your job search, whether you are still in school or are not looking for your real full-time job yet, or maybe you are um, looking for your first job, you're about to graduate or you're finishing the debt program, or maybe you're mid-career. I really believe that um, if you want to do something with your Japanese language and or cultural skills, then today hopefully will be that kick in the Oshiri that will help you get to that first step. So before I st I'm going to share a presentation, it's very brief, it'll just um, give you kind of an idea of what I'm going to be talking about today. I want to ask you a question. So if you could please write in the chat the answer to this question. Where are you looking for your job? Is it Japan? Is it the US? Is it in Europe? Or I saw Nigeria in there. Um, where are you looking for this job? Just it'll help me a little bit with my latter part. I see Japan, US, Japan or the US. Okay, good. Seattle, oh, specific states. Awesome. Hawaii, me too. Ah, oh, Japan. Okay, it's okay. We got some, or North Carolina. Nice, nice. All right. Oh, look at this. New York City, Michigan. Yay. I'm in Michigan, so <laughs> Japan or LA. All right. Oh, this is very, very good. These are great. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Okinawa. Ah, oh, Okinawa is beautiful. Um, good, good, good. So I will answer these questions in my presentation. So, um, and the one thing I want you to take away from uh, today is that anything is possible. And I know that's all like, oh, everyone says these, these motivational things are boring and whatever, but I'm serious. If you have a dream, I think that really nothing should stop you, not even the pandemic or a visa situation or an excuse or whatever. Um, I have seen and heard stories of people, I've witnessed it, who have overcome all crazy, all kinds of crazy odds and they've done what they wanted to do. It's not gonna be easy and it's not, you're not gonna do it tomorrow. It's not gonna appear out of nowhere. You actually have to do some work to get there. But if you are willing to put the work in, if you have this dream, and if you take that dream and you put it into bite-sized chunks and you work towards it, I really think that you can do it. And everything that you're doing, whether it's your, you know, your, I, I worked at a car wash, I worked at a drugstore, and I worked as, as a cashier and all those little things, they all teach you something, whether it's customer service, interacting with people, getting over being shy, like you know, handling money, like all that, any job is amazing for you. So think of each of your jobs, however many you have, whether it's one or 10, um, think of them all as stepping stones towards something that you really wanna get to because you won't really know what you wanna do until you actually try it. So that's always important because I've also met people who dreamt of becoming a whatever interpreter, translator, and then they get there like, oh my goodness, this is not what I expected. So experience will help you get there. So people who are already, I know there's some people here who are mid-career or quite advanced with like, you know, amazing professionals like our panel, they'll tell you that, you know, you just, you just keep taking a step in another direction and you will, you know, as long as you are working and becoming happy, I think it's important. So I'm gonna stop babbling for that part. I will share my screen and let me just give me a quick second to do this correctly. And I hope it's working out well. All right, so main things. Quick introduction because it's already been introduced. I'll talk about career ikigai, working in and outside of Japan. This is where I'm going to spend the majority of my time and a top tip that I'm going to leave you with. So get ready to have your socks just flying all over the place because these three people that are going to be in the panelists are just amazing and they're going to cover so many topics. Please, I encourage you to submit your questions and then and ask them some really juicy things. I think they'll really give you some good advice. Me, you've already heard my story. Um, I am just really passionate about helping people go for what they want to do. And if it has anything to do with Japan, then I am your gal. So I have a job board, nihongojobs.com. And I'm trying to, my goal, and the people who, I see some people who have been here with me from the beginning. Um, I started with like one job ad. And today I think it was 280, if I'm not mistaken. So slowly but surely I'm taking it. And it's been a long time coming, but I hope to become the go-to job board for any Japanese job in the United States. Overseas, I'll tell you about that in a little bit later. 
Ikigai. Many of you know, I have a t-shirt with Ikigai too. Many of you know, and they've heard of this word Ikigai and it's become famous. And, and there is a book written by Dan Butner about the blue zones and people living in Okinawa are healthy and they live the longest and Ikigai is their thing. This is, I'm sure you've seen these four circles. This is kind of a westernized version of what Ikigai really means. But my definition is what just, what, what you love to do. And if you want to have that love for what you do, be connected with your career. This is where I talk about a career ikigai because you're blending your knowledge of Japan or Japanese language, culture, business skills. You're blending it with your professional strengths because you got to have some of those too. It can't just be, oh, I speak Japanese. You also have to know how to use the computer, how to do, you know, preferably have like a second major where you're maybe an engineer or a lawyer or something else to aid with your Japanese language skills. That'll really be your secret to success. But even if it's just Japanese, you're still fine. Mm -hmm. I did that with sociology. It worked out well. Um, and then your um, personal interests, because we work so many hours of the day, it really would be helpful if we enjoyed what we did. So if you can find something, and I truly believe it's possible, you'll hear it from our panelists. If you can find something that you actually enjoy doing and you can make a living off of it, that I think is fantastic. And to put in Japanese in there is just another like, you know, topping on, on the cookie or the brownie or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Don't mind me and my silly examples. So that's Ikigai. So now I'm going to jump into working in Japan. So I'm getting right into the meat of it because we've got I'm going to be talking for another 20 minutes, I believe. I'll try to be quick. You can always go to my website. You can see it right here in the QR code. It might be a little small right now, but maybe later you can take a picture with your photo or it's just ikigaiconnections.com. I have so many resources for everything I'm talking about. If you have any questions, you can find it on my website. I have a, a part of my website called ikigaiconnections.com backslash Japan. If you go there, this is for you who you want to go to Japan and work there. It's a list of as many recruiters, job boards, language schools, advice, everything that I could gather. And at the very top, there's a link to an article, which I did a little snapshot right here. It's on BFF Tokyo. I'm working with Tyson over there and it's an article I wrote. It's really, really long. It's a guide. So you're, it's meant to be studied, but I talk about seven different ways to get to Japan. So obviously right now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, um, the pandemic. It's very difficult to get into the country, especially with getting a visa and traveling there. I'm, I think that even if you wanna to get to Japan, don't let the COVID stop you. Just do your research, do your networking. You can do so much before you actually get there. So just give yourself some time and that's, you just have to be a little bit patient, but eventually things will return to normal. We will be able to travel. But when you do decide, there's many ways you can get go about doing this. So in this article, I go way in depth and here I'm just gonna do a little bit of an overview. The easiest way, obviously, number one is to teach English. We've all heard about this. You try to find a company that's, um, and there's many of them, they're on my, on my list here. You can find a company to get you to Japan and the bigger a Kaiwa or English teaching schools, they will actually help you with finding a place to live and, and all the stuff that you need to know about getting to a new country. So that's really like great way to do that. There's also a lot of demand for it. So if you are going to do that, then you have to make sure your resume is standing out. You're really good in your interview and, and things like that and prove that you can become a good teacher and you are passionate about teaching, whether it's children or adults or anybody in between. So um, that's one of the easier ways to possibly get to Japan, especially because a lot of times the visa is an important component and it's included in that. Um, but not everybody's ikigai is to teach English and they wanna get there in a different way. Um, another one is the route number two is to apply for the famous JET program or the MEXT, which is the Monbu Kagakusho Scholarship. It's a scholarship where you go and you get an ex some time to study in a graduate school setting. Um, and it's, it's typically for people who would like to get into uh, educational field, but I did it myself um, back in the day. I actually could do it. I didn't have to be, I, I was a sociology major. So it, it was a little bit easier for me, this is a long, long time ago. I think that they're a little bit stricter right now, but I was able to get to Japan and it was the most amazing experience for me. I was able to get into the graduate school program and I had 100% Japanese. At times I felt like my head was going to explode, but it's it's really where I learned the language. So me personally, because I did the next, I'm forever grateful. 
and I will just forever keep talking about it because I'm very, very grateful. But the JET program, as many of you know, it's a way to get to Japan as well. They have a very, um, they have a great process. Things are a little bit up in the air right now with COVID, obviously, and, and things that are happening there. But keep that in mind. Um, there's, you go to their website, um, whether it's US JDA or JET, JET, there's, in my article, I have all the exact links, but you can see what the application process is like, and you can apply for either teaching English or being a CIR, which is a coordinator for international relations. And I tell a lot of my friends and, and followers who are interested in becoming an interpreter translator. And if you have a high level of Japanese already, the CIR role is something that I've heard phenomenal stories on how that helps boost you in that direction some more because you are really using it quite a lot of the day. And I'm sure we can hear more of that from our panelists. So that's another route. Skipping to number three, job hunt as a tourist. Now this is a little bit tricky, especially now, but most of us have a 90 day visa, tourist visa we, that we can use to get to Japan. While you're there, you can do some in-person job searching. Of course, that requires a lot of preparation in advance. And I tell people, do your research online, apply to jobs. And then if you get anywhere good that you can do an, an interview, then you can schedule those interviews in the during the 90 day tourist um, timeframe that you're going to be in Japan. Obviously you have to find a place to live for that long, but you know, I mean, hostels, friends, there's lots of, you can be um, on a tight budget or you can be very lavish and stay in very different places, but it'll also give you some time to check out Japan before you actually make that decision because Japan is a little different sometimes if you're not used to living in a foreign country or if you've never been to a foreign country. A lot of us have this dream about Japan that maybe it's this, you know, Tengoku, this heaven, but then when they get there, they, it's kind of a stark, it's like a, you know, reality check sometimes. And you, in your mind, had it a little bit more amazing than what it actually is. But like any country, there's, you know, every country has its own rules, its own customs, ways of doing things. So I would rather that somebody go there and travel instead of making a huge decision for their entire life to move to Japan and then get there and not really be as excited about being there anymore. So being there as a tourist, I think is very helpful in helping you make that decision because you're taste testing this country that you want to live in, you know, for the next few years. Me, on the other hand, I was, I didn't have that many expectations at all about Japan, but when I went there, I fell so in love with Japan that I stayed there for eight years. So I only intended to do it for a couple of times, but for me, it was the opposite. I loved it even more than I expected. So to each his own. So that's another option. Um, route number four, job hunt while studying Japanese in Japan and is another way to get there. So what you do is you find a program, a language program. Of course, it could be while you're still a student and a lot of universities have exchange programs that you can go. I went my junior year from my Boston University program to Kyoto on the KCJS program, Kyoto Consortium for Japanese Studies. In Michigan, we have the JCMU, Japan Center for Michigan Universities. All the states have some kind of consortium plans that you can join and go and study abroad while you're still a student. But even if you are already graduated, you can still get to a school in Japan. Um, there's a bunch I list on my list above here in the ikigaiconnections.com backslash Japan. There's some schools and you can get a student visa and study there for however long, whether it's a semester, half a year, a year, however long the programs are for, and you job hunt while you're studying. Now, of course, that could take a lot of time. And um, while you're studying, you're already using your brain and it's exhausting. So you just want to probably go back to your apartment and, and go to sleep or or just, I don't know, because you're tired, but it might be a lot to do, but it's another great way to get yourself in Japan and to work on that, to make connections, to go to job fairs and things like that. And again, yeah, everything right now with the pandemic is kind of on hold, but this is all just generic advice to keep in mind for the future. Next one is route number five. This is what I did, some serious shukatsu for students. Shukatsu, what does that mean? Shu shoku katsudo, it's the search for your job. And it is a serious thing. So it's, a, it's um, every year is the same. Depending on the industry and the companies, especially the bigger companies, their schedule might be a little bit different. However, in general, um, you know that in Japan, most of you may know that in Japan, the school year, the fiscal year, it all starts in April and it ends in March, okay? So when you graduate, you end in March and then you start working in April. That's kind of when all things begin like that. So the shushoku katsudo, the formal job searching also happens along that same time frame. So I had to, one year before I was graduating in March, I started my shukatsu 
and I started researching, reaching out to companies. You do something called an entry sheet, an entry sheet, where you go to their website or wherever. Each entry sheet is specific to the to the company. You complete it. It's like a a very un, uh, particular um, application for each company. You submit it, and then if you get accepted, then you go to the first round of group interviews and then individual interviews. I mean, it's very uh, rigorous and very um, strict schedule, but every company is different and every industry is different, like I said. So if you're interested in doing something like this, this is applicable for those people who are going to Japan in like junior year of college to go study abroad and to start that application process. Maybe you're gonna be in grad school or on the MEX program. That's what I did. I was during the MEX program trying to not have my brain explode from too much Japanese all day, trying to do this Shushoku Katsudo, which was just mind bogglingly difficult, but I did it and I survived and I loved it. And it made my Japanese even better because I was writing and this was by hand. So maybe now a little bit more um, it's on uh, computers that you can do it, but every entry sheet had to be unique. You could not copy paste and you had to send it in. So it was a lot of writing. Um, I really actually enjoyed it. So it's a process and you just have to do some research. So what you have to do is if you're interested in any company, you find their website and you go usually up in the upper right hand corner, it says Entori. They sometimes write it in English entry and you click there and you find, and these days I'm finding a lot of companies are open to non-Japanese people. So they actually have an English translation of some of their stuff. So, and I talk about all of this. I have this on my website as well. So if anybody's interested, just um, search for it on my website or send me a note and I can let you know where. So that's the serious shukatsu. Like you're just really involved and you're going to be a part of that um, process. But there's number six, the typical job hunt. And this is something where you just go to any job board, um, whether it's in Japan. And in Japan, I have a list of a bunch of them like jobsinjapan.com and, and you know, Weekend or all these places, they have a section for job ads. And you just um, apply send your resume and see what happens. Sometimes they'll accept candidates from overseas. Currently, I think a lot of the companies are not because of the visa status, they would prefer somebody who's already in Japan. So if any candidate here is in Japan already or any um, attendee is in Japan already, you have the advantage over everybody else who wants to get to Japan and you have the ability to start looking for these companies or openings at these companies. So um, that's that. And I'll just say, please, um, Try not to be too generic when you send your resume to a lot of these companies. Try to customize it for each company. I really think that it makes that person, the recruiter, or whoever who's reading those resumes, feel that they are getting specialized attention as opposed to sending out your resume to all hundred job ads that are available. Like people can see that. So try to make it a little bit more um, personalized. I think is definitely going to. It's going to get spend. You're going to spend more time on it, but it'll get you further. So good luck with that. And then last one, number seven, is to move to Japan as an expat. And this is something that you can do, let's say from overseas. I'm going to talk about America because that's where I'm located and that's where a lot of the attendees are located too. But, you know, if I wanted to find a Japanese company in my local area, maybe I would search for Japanese companies where I can use my Japanese language skills and, you know, figure out a way to get to Japan with this current company. So companies always send expats overseas to share knowledge and to meet other people and that's another great way for you to get sent to Japan, although it doesn't happen immediately. It's something that would happen over time, the longer you work at a company. And we can probably hear from maybe Jessica in the, um, in the panelist discussion, potentially if maybe her, you know examples of her company or something, but this is something very, um, it happens all the time. I've heard about it, at least here in Michigan. I know in Michigan, we have manufacturing, the automotive industry is pretty strong, but I've, I've heard of a lot of people going whether there are engineers who are who have Japanese language skills and can go to Japan and share and work in, in that company, um, there's just a lot of opportunities. So that's enough about Japan. So I have just like nine more minutes and I'm gonna talk real quick about the other option. And this is now my, let me see where, oh, here we go. Working outside of Japan. I'm gonna focus on the US in my, in my wording right now, but wherever you are in the world, I feel that it is absolutely possible to get a job using your Japanese language skills. So here in the US, in Michigan, we have 501 Japanese companies here. And I, I tell everybody, I'm like, if you wanted to work at these Japanese companies and you show them that you speak Japanese, that's a very unique thing to, to talk about and to, to say that you can do that because, you know, 
typically you've got, I, I, I'm going to guess maybe, you know, 90% or more of the people who are working at these companies know nothing about Japan. It's just another company that they're working at just happens to be headquartered in Japan. But if you have the language and the cultural business, cultural skills, you could be that greater asset to help them with any kind of work because they have to work with Americans and Japanese right here in Michigan. So you can help them with becoming like a kakehashi, which means bridge in Japanese. So there's just so many things that you could do, especially, especially if you have another like major or specialty. So if you have an MBA, if you have like, you know, accounting skills, if you have anything else that you can offer, you could apply for companies and maybe they don't even have the job opening um, promoted. You just, you know, send them a resume, kind of like a cold call type situation and say, hey, I would love to work at your company. I would love to utilize my Japanese language skills. What are your thoughts? And I think um, when I was job hunting a long, long time ago, that wasn't really a thing that you heard of. Like most of the time, if a Japanese company in the United States or in Michigan at least wanted to have a Japanese English speaking person, they would bring in a Japanese expat from Japan who spoke English. And there you go. So here I am like, you know, raising my hand saying, what about me? I want to work for you too. I want to use my language skills. And I'm like, yeah, but really you speak Japanese? Like it was just like kind of not really... I don't know, I didn't really hear about it much. And I really struggled to get my foot in the door. But now there's more and more. We're having job fairs in various locations here in Michigan with our Great Lakes Jet Alumni Association does a great job with organizing it. More and more, we're sharing the word with these Japanese companies about how these local people in this local area, we all study Japanese. Like there's so many schools across the nation that have Japanese language programs. There's so many people who are obsessed with Japan and just want to use the language skills like I'm sure a lot of the people here today. So even though you may not see these opportunities, I really think they exist as long as you look for them. So I listed some, there's two resource here, resources here that I list. The first one is an actual resource page that I have on my website where I had my amazing interns last year from um, October through December that created these pages. So if you want a job in Poland, for example, you just go to the Poland page and see what was created, what list is there. It includes recruiters, um, everything that I've written here at the bottom, recruiters, job boards, job fairs, language programs, et cetera. So if you're interested in these countries, please uh, consider taking a look at those lists. And also my job board is nihongojobs.com. So like I said, I'm working on getting, I want my dream is to become the go-to Japanese job board for Japanese jobs in the US. So I'm getting there, I promise you. So maybe if, if I don't have it right now, come back in like, I don't know, a week or a month or, or maybe even a year, I'm not sure, but I'm working on it. If you wanna find a job that's Japanese related in any states, then you can just select your state and um, see what opportunities are there. And I really think that it is possible. It's not going to be easy. You have to actually put yourself out there, which leads me to my final tip. I can't even tell you how many people I've run into who, and I, I don't think it's, um, I don't know why we're like this. I think it's a human thing, but kind of sitting there and waiting for an opportunity to come is really not a, the best way to go about doing this. You have to put yourself out there. And sometimes it's exhausting and job hunting is not easy. And, not, and this is just like a regular job, right? And this is like not even during the pandemic. So right now you've just got so many things against you but you have to keep putting yourself out there. And you know, doing that is, is so exhausting because you're putting out resumes and you're applying to companies, you're getting rejected. Maybe they're ghosting you, they're not calling you back. There's so many things that could go wrong but I think it makes us stronger. It makes you um, a better, I, th I think it really helps your character and your personality to just like keep like gambaru, right? In Japanese, persevere and keep putting yourself out there, whether it's the sending out the resumes or going to in-person networking events when they start happening again, or maybe over Zoom. I share on my LinkedIn, um, come on my LinkedIn page, a lot of events that are happening on Zoom where you go and you get put into separate rooms and you get to meet people. I mean, that's how I met, and you'll see the panelists, two of the panelists, and I know, Sansei, I know, because they're both from Michigan, but Anthony and Jessica, I met over LinkedIn. And it's it's great. You can actually meet each other on, on Zoom and, and talk to each other, get to know about each other. I think that is something that we really should, um, if you could please start doing that a little bit more. And I know if you're shy, it's really difficult, but try to put yourself out there. Try to go to maybe like one event, just like one first event and go there and check it out. And then maybe you'll have a little bit more courage to try another one because it really networking is really important to your job search. And I write about that in blogs too. So if you're interested, go to EI Connections and put the word networking in. I have two articles about that. 
And lastly, you know, it's the first one on the list here, online networking. This is so important. And I think and that a lot of people are using it. I want you to pick one social media platform that is the most important platform for your desired role, job, you know, dream. For example, I would say LinkedIn is probably the number one for most people because that's where you go and you and it's very specific to job searching. And um, the other ones though, like let's say I have, I think that Twitter might be easier and better for people who want to become like translators, interpreters in the manga world, things like that. That's a little bit where that community is. Facebook is more where like writers and copywriters and I know there's a lot of Facebook groups specifically and people get jobs from those Facebook groups. So figure out what's important for your dream job and put yourself out there. Mention what, the, what you're looking for and see what happens with that. But for LinkedIn, it's, I'm going to end on this. Please, um, we're going to have the links to our LinkedIn profiles showing up in the chat. So please reach out to us and let us know, you know that you were at this event. But I really, really, really want you to add a message because unlike Facebook or Instagram or the other networks, LinkedIn offers you an opportunity to write a note. And that note is so important because if I just get an invitation from somebody on my LinkedIn, I don't always know who you are and I would love to get to know you better, but sometimes just a plain invitation is like, I don't know, it's it's not as it's not as personable. So figure out a way to do it. It's different on the laptop and the laptop you click connect and it gives you a, a section to write a message in. On your cell phone, I have an I have an Apple phone. There you have to click more and then personalize the invite. In Android, I think is a little different, but Google whatever you have, try to figure it out. Try not to send people just plain invitations. Send a note and say, hey, hello Kasha, I saw you today at the networking event or whatever event, and I would really like to connect because I also blah 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 blah. And try to do that when you do that on LinkedIn. I really think it would be helpful. So that is it for me. I think I I'm right on the agenda. So if you have any questions, actually if you could most of the questions, please leave them for the panelists today. I think that you have to get more advice from them because they are just like amazing, amazing people. If you have any questions for me, find me on this. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, however, I can say, hold on one second. Stop sharing. Get me on my QR, QR code, send me a message, an email, and we can connect that way. So thank you so much for listening. I hope it was helpful. Arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you very much, Kasha. Everyone, please join me in thanking Kasha for the very detailed and uh, lovely information. Yeah, a lot of good stuff in there. Thank you so much for that. Um, but, uh, but wait, there's more. <laughs> Time to introduce our amazing panel, as Kasha was just saying, so we can dive in deeper on some of those points that she was bringing up. Um, so I would like to start introducing our panel one at a time. First of all, we have Jessica Cork, Vice President, Community Engagement and Corporate Communications, YKK Corporation of America. Ms. Cork is fluent in Japanese and has more than two decades of experience working in Japanese organizations. She has an MA in Advanced Japanese Studies from the University of Sheffield in the UK. Prior to joining YKK, she worked as the Advisor for Educational and Cultural Affairs at the Consulate General of Japan in Atlanta and spent three years as a coordinator for international relations in Hiroshima, Japan. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself just a little bit more and tell us uh, a little bit about how you got started in your career, Jessica? Yeah, thank you so much. And that, Kasha, that was amazing advice. I was thinking how I wish someone like you were there to advise me 24 years ago when I was starting my job search because um, so many of the things that, that you said in your presentation really resonated with me. I um, went to Japan for the first time in high school as an exchange student. Um, over the summer, I didn't speak a word of Japanese, spent eight weeks with a Japanese family, completely immersed in the language, absolutely fell in love with Japan and decided to major in Japanese in college. So I got my, um, my degree in Japanese from the University of Massachusetts, um, spent one year studying abroad at International Christian University in Tokyo, and then um, went on the JET program after, um, after graduating. So I definitely would love to hear any questions that anyone has about the JET program and specifically about the, um, the CIR position, which was absolutely amazing. But the thing is, when I came back to the US, I, first of all, I had no idea how to look for a job in Japan at the time. This was pre-internet days. I mean, we had internet, but it was like it was like 30 cents a minute the night you had to get on after 11 p.m. <laughs> like it, just, it, it was really, really hard in those days to, to be able to get this information. So I didn't really know how to find a job in Japan. So I decided to come back to the US. I had no other skills besides speaking Japanese. <laughs> I mean, I really did it. I, I did have other skills. 
but I really did not know what to do when I came back. And because I had the Japanese language skills, I just decided, well, of course, interpreting, you know, interpreting, translating, that's naturally what one does with a language degree. Um, I moved to Georgia. I, I'm originally from New Hampshire. I moved to Georgia. I did not know anybody in Georgia and uh, moved here to work for a manufacturing company, Japanese manufacturing company, as an interpreter. Within about two weeks of interpreting um, in the factory between the engineers, Japanese engineers and the American engineers, found out I hated interpreting, really disliked it. And um, here I'd moved halfway across the country <laughs> in this job that I, I just, I really did not, um, really didn't enjoy doing. But, um, but it was still a great learning experience. I, I think you mentioned it. It's like, it, you really don't know if you enjoy something until you try it. And some people absolutely love interpreting and make it their entire career. So I'm really glad that I did it. I'm glad that I found that out about myself that, that this was not what my calling was. Um, but you, you mentioned a lot about networking and that is absolutely how I found every other position after that. By the way, I did get a job um, in Georgia through using a recruiting company, Japanese English bilingual recruiting company. So that's, um, which was fantastic. That was a really great opportunity also because I didn't need to pay anything they found me a job in like a week and a half. Um, so, but after that, it was through connections that I made with, um, through jobs that were really not um, very well advertised. And so the, the first job that I had after that interpreting job was working for the consulate um, in Atlanta, which I absolutely loved. That was for 10 years. And then um, through my volunteer activities with the Japan America Society of Georgia, that was how I found the position at YKK because I knew the CEO um, of that company through our, um, we were both, you know, did um, various volunteer activities through the Japan America Society. So um, I won't take all the time now. I want to have a chance to hear from another panelist, but um, I would love to hear your questions, but especially about things about volunteering and networking, networking online and also networking as an introvert, which I am um, proud to admit that I'm an introvert and hate networking in person. <laughs> so please ask me those questions as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. It's a real pleasure to have you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I also understand that you're having some pretty serious thunderstorms and tornado watches in your mm -hmm. area right now. So uh, everybody, if, if she has a power outage or something, please bear with us. Um, uh, it's also interesting you, you got some experience with uh, interpretation and uh, maybe, maybe even some not so positive experience with it. We've had a couple of questions come in so far about that specifically. So put a pin in that, we'll, we'll come back to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, next, I would like to introduce uh, Anne M. Hogart, who is also joining us today, Educational Research Coordinator and Board Secretary, Hinoki Foundation, and Senior mm -hmm. Cultural Public Relations Specialist, Con uh, Consulate General of Japan in Detroit. So uh, uh, Dr. Hogart is a career, educa uh, career educator as both teacher and administrator. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hogart has studied Japanese language and culture for over 30 years, including mm -hmm. doctoral research, research on schools and uh, teacher learning in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, she is raising her children to be Japanese English bilingual. So uh, Dr. Hogart, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, those are some of the positions I currently hold. <laughs> uh, I also teach a Japanese uh, to uh, students online at a certain community colleges in Michigan. I'm also placed in Michigan, as Tasha mentioned, uh, and have a somewhat similar story to Jessica in that I was introduced to Japan as a high school exchange student, did not speak a word of Japanese. It was pre-internet, so on and so forth. And I did fall in love with the culture, the people, the food, the whole bit. And uh, it changed all my decisions about where I would go to college and what I would do and so on and so forth. But these were the 80s. You may have heard of the uh, time when Japan had a bubble economy and so on and so forth. So Japan was the goose that laid the golden egg and you could just go there and you know make all this money supposedly was the idea. So I knew I wouldn't want to be a teacher. I'd always convinced myself I would never ever want to teach. Uh, it was not sexy. You couldn't make a lot of money and you know, all these different things going out of my brain. And so what I did is I did do the JET program just to get back to Japan. <laughs> so when I graduated from the University of Michigan or the Japanese Studies Bachelors, uh, I thought, well, I wanna go back to Japan. I've been dying to go back to Japan for four years. So I will just go and do one year of teaching English just to get back to Japan. 
they placed me in my sister state, which I didn't even know Michigan had a sister state at the time. I think they do a better job now of advertising that, but I was placed there with a wonderful a Japanese English teacher who uh, I now look back and that was basically my student teaching. Uh, she taught me so much about how to teach, but of course I left after a year coming back here because I had to get into international business, right? And um, I ended up being called to teach at the local uh, community college and also at a university. And then uh, when I was hired by a Japanese company, we have so many as uh, Kasha mentioned, and they're all over the country as well uh, and internationally. So, you know, please don't think you have to go to Japan to work for the Japanese. They're all over the world. <laughs> but in any case, I worked at a Japanese company. And what did they ask me to do? I had to teach English to the Japanese execs and I had to teach Japanese to the American workers. So I was teaching all the time. And so basically I finally figured out that I needed to be a teacher. So I had already gone back to my alma mater and gotten a master's in Japanese studies uh, with pieces that were about business and linguistics and education. Somehow I really had this affinity for the Japanese education system. Um, and so basically I ended up being a high school teacher of Japanese. Uh, again, I was only gonna do it for a year uh, and I ended up being there for five years started out with 10 students in five years. I had 150 and 20 on the waiting list. And then I said, you know, I kind of seem to know what I'm doing with this teaching thing and I really like it. So maybe I'll go get my PhD so I can teach teachers how to teach. And I thought I need to get over this Japan thing. I'm just gonna go, you know, straight foreign language, whatever. And so I taught at a university that had no um, Japanese at all. And I was just teaching teachers uh, and happy as a clam. And then I got married and we had two kids and we decided, you know, we both speak Japanese. We really should give the gift of bilingualism to our kids. And so when my children started speaking at age two, they spoke Japanese. We do not use English in our home. So I thought, you know, my husband uses Japanese. He's an interpreter translator at Toyota. He gets to use it every day. I need to switch careers so I can use it every day. And so I became a translator for about four years. Uh, and again, that's another highly specialized skill. I was never an interpreter. Uh, we can talk about the differences there. Um, but then I was recruited away from that by the Consulate General of Japan in Detroit. And at this stage, you know, when you turn 50 and up, you should be setting some parameters or you can be. And so one of my parameters was, I can only work for you part-time and I want Tuesdays and Thursdays off so I can teach. <laughs> if you can't do that for me, I don't need the job. So. I'm at that stage in my career. I assume many of you are, you know, it sounds like some of you are mid-career, but others are probably more beginning. So there are various stages that you can be at. If you're, you know, just getting out of college, I wouldn't say put a whole bunch of conditions on your hiring. But in any case, uh, I'm loving what I do. Uh, I get to do both, you know, work as a bureaucrat, <laughs> promoting Japan uh, to Americans and uh, trying to help uh, Japanese people who live in Michigan. Uh, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, I'm teaching uh, Japanese language and culture to uh, people who want to learn it at the community college. So, um, and also I'm a volunteer. Oh, I need to promote Hinoki Foundation. So this is my volunteer life that for the last seven years, I get to promote to K through 12 students in Michigan and elsewhere, uh, how great it is to speak Japanese and know about Japanese culture. And so we really try to promote that and help them out. Well, thank you so much, Anne. We're so happy to have you. It's a very interesting career, and I think uh, you could have a, a, a lot of interesting information to share for any of the questions that, that come in. So Certainly, thank I do want to try to move on to that uh, pretty pretty quickly here, but I did also want to mention very quickly that the JET program is very well represented in our uh, in our little event today. Um, so myself, I'm also a JET alum, and then uh, my colleague in the Seattle office, uh, Samantha Corpus, also uh, working very hard to make this uh, meeting happen from behind the, behind the scenes right now. Uh, she is actually the president of the Pacific Northwest JET Alumni Association chapter up here in Seattle. So yeah, we're happy to talk, uh, answer any questions about the JET program later on in the Q&A section as well. But thank you so much, Anne. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, finally, I would like to introduce Anthony Griffin, who's also joining us today, a marketing consultant, communications coach, and writer based in Tokyo, Japan. <clears throat> So before moving to Japan in 2009, Mr. Griffin managed more than 250 marketing projects a year for the city of Riverside, California. And since relocating, he served as the marketing and communications manager for the American Chamber of Commerce in Japan. As a communications coach, he has been credited for helping Fortune 500 executives earn global level promotions 
and often gives marketing and communication lectures at universities and corporations. So everyone, join me in welcoming Anthony Griffin. Thank you so much, Gabe. It is a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank everyone for spending their time uh, to view all of us today. So um, yes, I'm a communications consultant here in Tokyo. I have lived and worked here for 12 years. And I think a unique thing about me is that I did come here mid-career. So a lot of you are here um, or that are here in the audience are mid-career professionals. So I really hope I can help you today. Um, at this point, I'd like to say that it is I guess my destiny to be here. It feels like that. Um, if I look back, you know, I was born in the 80s, as uh, Dr. Hogarth said, that was the bubble era. And um, as a Californian from Riverside, I was heavily influenced by Japan, you know, pop culture, technology, um, you know, electronics, cars, everything. Um, however, that uh, didn't become serious until I entered uh, college and started studying business. And we had to take a foreign language for one year. I had already studied Spanish. I said, let me give Japanese a try. I might not make it, I might fail, but this is, a, this is an opportunity. I tried it, it was difficult at first, but I loved it, I did well. And uh, that started to get me to think, well, maybe I should visit Japan someday. Fast forward, I graduated, I started working, I returned to school to get my MBA. I didn't uh, speak or use Japanese too much, but eventually I settled into a marketing job for the city of Riverside. And there were opportunities to you know, travel to Japan on vacation. Uh, Sendai, Japan is our sister city. So Japan started showing up in my work. And after visiting Japan twice, I thought, okay, let me see what it's like to live and work here. So after establishing my career, I had to figure out how to come to Japan. And to do that, for me, I chose the Eikaiwa route, which is the commercial uh, business, or in my case, business e English teaching route. So I came over through Eon. And as uh, Kasha had mentioned, you know, they really provide a lot of support. They get you an apartment, they get you a network, and they paid attention to my background and references, which means they put me right in Shinjuku, Tokyo's business district. So right away, I was working with business professionals, executives, CEOs, designing business curriculum. So I was bringing my career with me instead of really making a career jump or a career shift. So within two years, I was promoted to the corporate office. I was dispatched to some of Japan's and some of the world's largest uh, companies. And not only could I share Western business, you know, coaching Western business English, but I also learned from executives and CEOs how to succeed in Japan. So fast forward, I returned to marketing with the American Chamber of Commerce. And then after about two years there, I finally realized my dream of working for myself here in Japan. And that's what I'm doing now. So uh, thanks again. And, and I really am looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Anthony, for joining us. I think it's uh, really fantastic to have that more sort of entrepreneurial spirit represented in the conversation today. I think that's, you hear a little bit less about that. I can't wait to hear more about what you have to say on that topic. Although I have to say after my time on the JET program, I did uh, get into the Eikaiwa industry myself. The second time I returned to Japan used uh, that kind of for the visa. And um, I was with ECC, so you and I are rivals, I, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> but yeah, looking forward to hearing more from you in the, in the panel discussion. So let's uh, get right into the Q&A. Uh, let's start taking some questions from the audience. Um, I wanna start right off the bat with one that I know is pretty common. And uh, Kasha, I know this is, this is a question that you field quite a bit. Um, so we'll see, we'll, we'll open this up to the whole panel though. In today's Japanese market, both US and Japan, how pertinent is it to hold an N1 or N2 certificate in the Japanese language proficiency mm -hmm. test, the JLPT? Oh, I am very passionate about this, but I am just going to say one thing. I wrote an article. I'm going to put the link into mm -hmm. the thing and have any of the other panelists talk about it. I think the JLPT doesn't test a lot of the things that you need in a link in your career. Mm. So you should just take it with a grain of salt. 
still take it. I really think you should take it, but try to convince the employers that you're applying to that just because you didn't take it, because again, it was canceled last year because of the pandemic mm -hmm. here, I hope it goes on, but it's not, it's not the end of the world if you don't take it. I still mm -hmm. want you to do so. I'm going to add a link into the thing and have anybody else who wants to chime in and say what their thoughts are. Mm -hmm. May I just jump in and say that the uh, Japanese language proficiency test, which we're all talking about as if everybody knows what it is, JLPT, Nihongo no Ryokushiken, is something that I only passed uh, N2, which is the second highest level, N1 is the highest and could uh, allow you to uh, enter some Japanese colleges and so on. Uh, but I've only passed N2 and barely, and this is 20 years ago. The key to me is to be a lifelong learner and also um, the proof's in the pudding. When you get to the interview, you know, Japanese people are going to see. Uh, and I think one of the bigger things in language is culture. You know, are you calling people by the correct title? Do you look down when you bow or do you do the karate kid, you know, I'm going to kick you in the head thing. Um, so I think there are subtle and less so cues that will uh, tell people about your actual proficiency. But, uh, and just on another note, back in the day when my husband, who has worked for Toyota as their top uh, translator and interpreter, he has never taken, let alone passed, the JLPT. But I think it's, that's a different era. That is, you know, 30 years ago. I think, as Kesha says now, you're going to be compared with others. And to the extent that you will be, you want some kind of metric. And that would probably be the JLPT. Yeah, if I could add to that, in, I would say check if it aligns with your career goals. So mm. I had two phases of my career here. I was mm -hmm. a company man in the beginning. And during mm -hmm. that time, I was taking the uh, JLPT mm -hmm. and focusing mm -hmm. on that. However, once I started taking on clients and working freelance, mm -hmm. I realized, well, mm -hmm. if I'm writing emails in Japanese and I'm <laughs> selling myself in Japanese mm -hmm. and talking to companies in Japanese, mm -hmm that's sure. what they want no one mm -hmm. asks me about my certifications mm -hmm. because they're experiencing it so mm -hmm. uh, I would just add to that just check if it aligns with your goals and mm -hmm. then go from there yeah. yeah and I would just add I've never once been asked and I don't think that any of the Japanese people who have ever interviewed interviewed mm -hmm. me for a position even know what it is <laughs> um, it was it was based on the interview entirely mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. how well you come across me in their interview speaking mm -hmm. Japanese they can they can tell pretty mm -hmm. quickly what your proficiency level is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it but it was a personal goal you know of mm -hmm. mine to study for it and to take it but it's not exactly. as much for career purposes exactly interesting yeah so uh that sort of feels like the hurdle that everybody feels that they need to jump over but it sounds like we're getting a lot of uh, answers from the panel saying maybe <laughs> maybe not so much but the answer here is not to not have the ability to pass the test, mm. it's to have that ability, but whether or not you need the paper, piece of paper, paper is maybe just not so as important. Mm -hmm. um, okay, great, well, so let's move on to the next question then. Uh, my dream is to be an interpreter, English to Japanese mm. for the Olympics. Uh, I was curious if any of the panelists or sponsors have any tips on how to become an interpreter. Mm. Jessica, do you want to talk a little bit about how you got started with that? I, I, uh, it's going to be an interesting answer coming from you, but I'd, I'd be curious to hear what you have to say. Sure, sure. Um, and I, th I think also one, one regret, um, if I can share that I do have about the position that I had as an interpreter and translator. Um, and actually, I should also explain how I mentioned that I, I found out that I disliked interpreting, but actually I love translating. Mm. And I think it's important to realize which of those skills um, that you prefer, because they're very, very different. And I didn't Mm -hmm. quite realize I mean of course you know interpreting is spoken and and mm -hmm. and um, translating is writing but mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. to kind of think that through as well um, when you're looking at those those very language-based skills because mm -hmm. what I disliked about the interpretation was the fact that you don't have quite as much time to think through like exactly mm -hmm. how to say something absolutely perfectly and you have to be really comfortable with being doing everything on the fly and mm -hmm. and making mistakes quite a lot of the time because mm -hmm. you don't exactly you have to ask for clarification you don't know a word mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. really enjoyed I instead love the process of translating where you have the opportunity to um, really think through exactly the perfect, perfect way of saying something, you know, make it really tweak it, really come up with a, you know, something that's really beautiful. And I like the fact that something that has been translated will exist 
past the moment in which you create it. Mm -hmm. Interpreting at the end of the day, mm -hmm. I always felt like I never had anything left. It was like mm -hmm. the day, you know, the next day started again and I, I didn't have anything tangible. Mm -hmm. Now that's going to vary for certain people because my husband also speaks Japanese. He loves interpreting, mm -hmm. hates translating. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's that's one one thing I'd like for um, mm -hmm. anyone considering those two career paths to think, think that through. Um, what I do wish as far as the interpreting part of it is I, I really wish I had taken some formal courses that will teach you the skills that you need to interpret. Just because you can mm -hmm. speak Japanese does not mean that you can interpret. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is a very specialized skill. And I was simply hired because I had sufficient Japanese language ability mm -hmm. to be able to do it in theory. But mm -hmm. in practice, what it is, you have to be really good at like listening and remembering everything mm -hmm. that is coming with you while talking at the same time. I mean, I find out very quickly, I have a terrible memory. I mean, someone can talk to me I'll listen to what they said and I'll go to repeat it. And I can't remember what someone <laughs> said five minutes ago. So I walked around with a notepad, you know, furiously writing down every single thing that was said because I could not retain it in my brain. Mm -hmm. that, I, that is not a good recipe for being a good interpreter for a long period of time. So, um, but I think that having taken some courses and there are courses out there that you can take. I know that um, out in Monterey, California, you know, there's, um, uh, what's the name of the Monterey Institute? I, is that the yes. name of that university out there? Yeah, I, I know they have courses and things. That's what I wish that I had done. I would have been a much better interpreter um, had I done that. Um, but I, but in my experience, it's pretty easy to get a job. As a, I don't know for the Olympics, but um, just at working for a Japanese company in the U.S., I think it's relatively easy to get a job as an interpreter translator if you have um, language skills that are at a high enough level to be able to do that. There's great demands for it, especially in manufacturing and especially um, for technical interpreting because many of the engineers do not speak um, English well enough to be able to communicate with the American engineer. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Anybody else have any experience they wanna share or any thoughts on the topic of becoming an interpreter? Well, I just want to throw in because I haven't been an interpreter, but I've been married to one and I've worked with many and I've been a translator and Jessica's absolutely right. It's a personality difference. And I would go so far as to theorize those of us who are more anal retentive perfectionist and like to double check things and look things up uh, are probably more uh, geared toward the, the written translation mode. And those of us who like to, you know, dash it off and perform and have, throw a little BS in and, and maybe think in terms of the forest instead of individual trees, like my husband, um, they might be more interpreter type. Uh, and so uh, know, know thyself and choose wisely. <laughs> the translator one. Thank you. Any, anybody else? <clears throat> I guess I, I could sort of just add that uh, I've, I've done uh, freelance translation work, but only ever for like um, just, just freelance where like a company gives their stuff to another service and they give it to you and you're paid by the word. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I, I got the sense that if I had really grinded it out and worked <laughs> that way for a while, mm -hmm. I could have gotten like maybe an internal job where you're actually mm -hmm. translating directly for a company and that would have been mm -hmm. much better. But mm -hmm. in, that, um, in that situation, I couldn't ask any questions. And Japanese is a very, very context dependent <laughs> language. And so I think it's like games where you're not even given the whole game or you don't get the chance to play it, play it or anything like that. Mm -hmm. They just give you these like, no, translate this. I'm like, I don't know. I got to ask questions. They wouldn't let me do that. So mm -hmm. it's a tough gig. It's a tough gig. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, don't want to uh, advise anybody mm -hmm. away from it, but it's, it's tough. And I think you have to kind of grind away at it for a while. Right, right. May I just throw in one more thing? I'm sorry. But when I saw Middlebury, one of my former uh, colleagues, she graduated from there. So yes, now it's called Middlebury Monterey or whatever mixed together, but um, quite expensive. And I guess you can get out in two years. But what they will say and what my old boss said is first, go out and get some business experience, get experience in manufacturing, mining, you know, automotive, whatever you like, chemicals, I don't know what you like, but go find out about it because you need to know that perfectly in English. And then you need to get the semonyogo, the special language, you know, that is used for special technology in Japanese as well. If you come in, I am tabula rasa, you're not going to be that useful. You need to get some specific field experience, mostly field work for three years or, or so is what my old boss used to say. Don't just do it straight out of a bachelor's. Go work somewhere and then go be an interpreter is what she would say. I think that's really great advice. Uh, let's move on to our next question. 
Uh, what jobs can I do during my undergrad that will let me gain professional experience, but that will actually hire me as a student without a bachelor's degree yet? If nobody else is jumping in, I really am a big proponent of volunteering and interning. Now, it sounds like you want to get paid, but when you are a student, you have some time. And sometimes even when you're just, you know, right out of <laughs> sitting in a pandemic after you graduate, uh, you may have excellent opportunities uh, to be an intern uh, and, and or a volunteer. Uh, volunteers can't be fired. <laughs> it's great. And so if you find out that you hate it, as Jessica did, uh, right, they you know, you can leave on good terms, right? And no harm done. Uh, and also you can be like me and say, oh, I hate that, I hate that, I never wanna be a teacher and then try and go, oh, wow, I actually love it. So uh, these are low stakes opportunities. So that's the kind of thing I would say. Uh, and I was even told when I did my master's, I wanted to be a consultant. And I read this book about how can you be a consultant? You know, nobody's ever consulted you. Uh, and they said, volunteer, do it for free at first. And then if your stuff is good, people will then wanna pay you, right? So your stuff, what is your product? What do you provide? What, you know, are you any good at it? Do they want you back? You know, then they'll start paying you. So that would be my advice. Yeah, I'd like to say um, it also, you might want to consider a, a new mindset. So if, if you have a particular skill or a passion that you like, leverage the power of the internet. So when I was growing up, you needed permission to do basically anything. You needed permission for someone to give you a job. You needed a permission from a publisher to publish a book because we, we didn't have blogs and things. But now if you have a skill, there are so many freelancing websites. Uh, there are opportunities online where a lot of smaller companies or individuals, they're not thinking about you know, your degree or your experience. If you, for example, want to translate, do a translation, provide it and get feedback on it. it you know, you might fail, you might succeed, but you don't know until you go out and try. And I'd just like to say that, uh, try to think in a different mindset. It's not about what degree you have or what experience you have. It's about, can you do the work? And there are you know, many, many, many opportunities online to try that. And you might even be able to get paid and use that money to fund your future Japan career. So I think that's something that a lot of people overlook. You just don't need permission anymore. You can go out and write, you can translate, you can show that off. And, and if you'd like to learn more about this kind of attitude, there's a great book called Show Your Work. And I think if you read that book and, and follow some of the things in there, you'll be able to do basically anything you want and start building experience before you graduate. Interesting. Great. Show your work. I, I saw everybody kind of slowly start taking notes on that. I, th I think you just <laughs> sold a couple of books. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't good. my intention. It's just a good book. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, okay. Well, why don't we jump into the next question then? Uh, we got a lot of them, so I want to start going through them uh, quickly here. Uh, what would you say are the top three growing industries for English Japanese linguists? If I may um, add a quick sure. comment. So we're going to get a little bit specific now, because if we're going from English into Japanese, that would mean preferably a Japanese native speaking person. If we're doing Japanese into English, it'll be like me, an American studying Japanese. So I just have to clarify that, especially for anybody out there who's interested in interpreting, translating, you're typically listening or reading in your foreign language and speaking and writing in your native language. So when it comes to the top three industries that I would know of from Japanese into English, maybe in the United States, I'm not quite certain. I'm gonna just put in a vote for manufacturing is huge. Manufacturing in the United States is absolutely um, a, a big, big part of our world. I'm in Michigan in automotive industry and I am not interested in cars in the least, but I spent my best like amazing five and a half years working in the automotive industry because I wasn't necessarily doing anything with the cars. I was doing things with like the international relations, the business stuff, the connections between Japan and the US, the Japanese expats coming from Japan to the US. So I really had nothing to do with the automotive industry per se. I was dealing with the people and the business topics. So maybe don't worry too much about the industry as much, although that always helps. I found it to be, to me, it was more about what role am I fulfilling regardless of the industry, but that's just my little two cents right there. 
Yeah, I have to put in a plug for manufacturing as well. I'm in Georgia. I work for a manufacturing company, so YKK, we manufacture zippers. Um, and we have more than 650 Japanese companies in Georgia. And I think, I don't know the exact statistics, but I'd say 80% are manufacturing companies. Um, and they all have hired, um, you know, Japanese speaking Americans in various roles. I, not all, but I do know quite a few people working at those companies. Um, and many of them have reached, you know, high level executive roles and things. And the other thing that has to be said as well, that's not necessarily all because of um, language skills, but certainly the cultural skills. There are a lot more Japanese companies that are starting to localize positions too. I did see um, along, you know, in the chat, someone asking about that. But in fact, you know, I replaced a Japanese expat. So there, the person that was in my position at YKK prior to me was um, transferred back to Japan and the decision was made to localize that position. So many of the Japanese manufacturing companies have been in the United States for quite some time now. They're no longer new anymore. You know, the uh, YKK has been in Georgia since 1970. And um, so there are are fewer expats that are, are, are coming over because there's more and more Americans that are taking those positions. But that does mean that the people in those roles still need to be very comfortable working with their Japanese colleagues. And certainly having Japanese language skills and having spent time in Japan is very helpful for those roles as well. So it doesn't have to be language-based either to, to Kasha's point, but certainly you can utilize those skills in your job every day. And to add a, another industry or category, you might also want to look into the startup scene. So as basically a sole proprietor here, most of my clients are small or medium-sized companies. So I end up working with startups on occasion, and that scene is growing here. It's no Silicon Valley, not even close, but it is growing. There's a lot of excitement about it. And as probably many of you know, the population is in decline here, which means growing businesses are going to have to go global and they're going to go into, you know, different countries all around the world. So we have people in this audience from several different uh, countries look at Japanese startups and see if they have expressed interest in entering your company or maybe they should in enter your company and see if there are any opportunities there because eventually a lot of companies that want to grow, that want to become the next big thing, they're gonna to have to go outside of Japan and they're gonna need people to support them on the ground in those countries. So in addition to manufacturing, look into tech as well. There might be some opportunities there. Great, yeah, a lot of good advice. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. I think manufacturing is definitely a really good point um, in, in various various fields. Uh, I'll just put in one more plug for automotive. I lived in uh, Nagoya in Chubu for a long time. And uh, uh, Chubu is the automotive manufacturing center of Japan. Uh, Toyota City is there. Not, not, I mean, obviously the corporate headquarters as well, but Toyota City is there. And uh, Chubu uh, Central uh, International Airport is, uh, is right there. There's only one direct flight from Chubu Airport uh, to the United States, and it's not to New York, it's not to Los Angeles, not Los Angeles, it's to Detroit. Um, the automotive industry is huge, and uh, there's a lot of collaboration. And uh, even if you're not necessarily specifically interested in cars, um, I think as uh, maybe Kasha, I, I'm sorry, somebody mentioned this earlier. There's a lot of other stuff that pops up around it because of how much money is involved in those industries. So you don't necessarily have to be involved with cars to want to sort of get connected to some of those companies and manufacturing um, related to that. Um, another quick question. Uh, I thought this was actually kind of interesting, more of a mid uh, mid career question uh, that I'm not sure I know the answer. I'm curious uh, what what uh, you guys might think about this. I'm a mid career HR professional, and I'm worried many of my skills and knowledge won't transfer well to the Japanese workplace. How can people with specialized skill sets find a way to gain the required knowledge to fill the workforce gap without actually working in said roles in Japan? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that. I'll give this one a try. Um, Please do. It's, it's, it's hard to answer that question without knowing your specific mm -hmm. role. Uh, so my first suggestion, and, and maybe you've already done this, would be research. And what to research? Research what HR functions or roles Japanese companies need. Uh, you know, this kind of goes back to Kasha and finding your ikigai. So you have your skill, something you're good at. 
you know, what the world needs. And of course, next you have to figure out, can it make money? Uh, mm -hmm. I will say uh, after marketing, HR is my second skill and where I have mm -hmm. some experience. Mm -hmm. For Japanese companies that are trying to go global, you know, HR is just totally mm -hmm. different. And there, I have found there are a lot of opportunities to prepare Japanese companies to work, especially in America, where we have some pretty strict HR rules mm -hmm. compared to mm -hmm. Japan, Japan. Uh, especially regarding uh, privacy as mm -hmm. well as anti-discrimination laws and things mm -hmm. like that. So to, to wrap it all up, if perhaps you specialize in, for example, anti-discrimination work or something like mm -hmm. that, there's definitely a need here in Japan for companies that are entering countries with very strict HR mm -hmm. uh, uh, laws and regulations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, anyone else on that one? I'll just mention a quick comment about networking. So whatever, if I, I think I, I understood that maybe coming from HR, going back into HR, but in Japan, regardless if it is HR or a different field. I think networking and getting to know people and asking what's available and saying, hey, because in my opinion, like I mentioned at the very beginning, the skills that you learn in any job can be applied to so many mm -hmm. other things just because it's a different industry or a different job role. Mm -hmm. You're still working on the computer, you're working on programs, you're talking to people, you're connecting, communicating. There's so much that you can do. It is up to you to sell yourself. So don't just expect um, a resume, yeah, sending a resume out is great too, of course, but when you're networking, you're connecting with someone on a human level and you're kind of letting them know more about your personality, whether you're a go-getter or you just like to sit all day and do nothing, which is great too, but I probably should do more of that. But like talk to connecting with people, I think is extremely, extremely helpful in that regard. So there's got to be some kind of networking group available. I know on my list that I wrote for ikigaiconnections.com backslash Japan, there's a couple of networking groups I've listed, mostly in the tech world, um, startup scene, but like um, some digital marketing, I believe. But you just find these groups, whether it's a meetup, even if, if, if you're in a different country, you can still join these meetups and get to know these people. So networking. Hey, I'm so glad you brought that up. That leads me into my next question. Uh, I am very interested in networking and building social connections locally in the U.S. Mm -hmm. to find opportunities. Uh, what advice do the panelists have for finding these opportunities? Note, I could find events uh, to attend pre-COVID, um, but I'm especially having trouble, a hard, hard time now due, due to COVID. So mm -hmm. uh, networking pre-pandemic and maybe uh, during the pandemic too. I would, I would like to uh, take a stab at this question because um, I'm the vice chair of the Japan America Society of Georgia. So please reach mm -hmm. out, first of all, to your local Japan America mm -hmm. Society. Um, there are um, Japan America Societies in every single state, I think, um, throughout the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I am sure that most of the other societies, just like ours, have moved a lot of our networking opportunities onto online um, platforms. So we're offering, for example, Japanese language classes that mm -hmm. are were previously all held in person are now being held online. And that's a good way to network. Um, and also um, various events that um, that we've been having have breakout sessions and, and things like that. I actually found my job at YKK, as I mentioned, through the connections that I made through the Japan America Society. Um, so I think that's a great way to do it. And the other thing is, I think um, we mentioned a little bit earlier, but about the power of LinkedIn and that also on what I have started doing and I wish I had thought about it um, much sooner than I did. But once we moved into so many, you know, attending so many events online, I just started reaching out to the panelists and to the speakers at pretty much every event that I mm -hmm. attend, you know, and just reach out to them and say, hey, I was in, you know, I attended your session. Here's what I got out of what you had to say. Would you mind connecting with me? And I've made amazing connections that way, um, starting with Cash and other, mm -hmm. you know, other people. So I think um, that, that's how I would answer uh, mm -hmm. that question. But I'd love to hear what else everyone has to say on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to emphasize what Jessica just said, uh, you know, starting at, at events like these and seeing the panelists and seeing the people asking questions and then 
going on to LinkedIn after with a message and saying, hey, I watched your panel. I have some questions. Uh, doing that has, has been so successful. I mean, I have to network to survive. I get most of my business through relationships and networking and personal selling. So of course, before the pandemic, I was at the typical events and things like that. Uh, then the pandemic hit and I've been doing exactly what Jessica's been doing. We connected before this panel, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, you attend these events, see the panelists and then follow up with them on mm -hmm. LinkedIn. And that just opens up more doors and they're gonna introduce you to more people and more resources. And mm -hmm. I have found it to be just about a, as effective as in personal, or mm -hmm. sorry, excuse me, uh, in-person network. Mm -hmm. It's just a different style that you have to adapt to. Right. I agree. And I'll, I've learned so much, you know, from all these folks and especially Kasha, who will probably tell you, she also tends toward the uh, introvert side or, you know, a little of each and also was not into social media at all until she started her company and then a pandemic hit. So what I found is that um, a lot, another benefit of all these is these Zoom meetings or whatever, these online meetings, they tend to all now be free. So, you know, whereas sometimes I've had people in the past say, I can't pay that much for a Japan American Society dinner or whatever. Now you just get on for free. Um, the w major groups that I think would help at least people in North America, uh, Japan American Societies, we have them in Canada as well. Um, and they're everywhere. And how about your consulate general of Japan? There's at least a dozen in North America. Jessica worked at one, I'm working at one. Uh, they have lists on their websites of groups that get together uh, for exchanging Japanese culture. There are wonderful meetup.com language exchange groups if you want to practice or polish your Japanese language. There's tons of free exchange groups online. Um, and other ones for those of us who have been on the JET program or even if you're interested, some of these JETA jetaa.org, so jetalumniassociation.org. They're again all over the world and they uh, have uh, sometimes these events and they'll say friends of jets. So as Anthony said, go be friends with one of us so that you can then be invited to these uh, events. So there's many, many, many things going on. You just have to tap into them. One more quick thing. I know we're running out of time. Volunteer. If you are so shy and you just don't want to like join these events and you have no idea what to do, Mm -hmm. If I was in Michigan, I'd be like, Michigan, Japanese mm -hmm. organization. Oh, look, mm -hmm. Hiroki Foundation. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello, Ann Sensei. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything that I can do for a weekend? Can I help yes. you with something? And then I get to know Ann Sensei, and Ann mm -hmm. Sensei knows everybody. And maybe I tell her, hey, I have a dream of doing computer work mm -hmm. somewhere. Oh, I happen to, you know, like, it just, you say things mm -hmm. out loud. You say what, you, mm -hmm. what you're thinking of. You reach mm -hmm. um, out to other people. You have to take mm -hmm. that one baby step. Mm -hmm. And I think volunteering is a great way to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I True. think you uh, basically answered this next, next question uh, that I'm about to ask uh, mm -hmm. already with that one. So keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to throw this out because of the panelists that we have here, because um, I think there might be some inf interesting information from this. Uh, I have a question about working in governmental positions such as mm -hmm. the consulate. Can you achieve that easily without having a major that is government politics related? I am a Japanese and tourism double major. I think the short answer is yes. And then the longer answer is, please be aware, you are not going to become the ambassador of Japan, right? You're an American citizen. So if your goal is to climb into some position for the US government, which is you know where your citizenship lies, this might be a good training ground, but we are what is called local staff. Local staff, by definition, are not the diplomats. You are serving and supporting the diplomats or above you. So I want people to be aware of that before they say, oh, I'm going to, you know, but I think the short answer is yes. It's much more important, you know, how much you love Japan, want to promote it and are helpful, smart, on time and courteous. Yep, I would, I would agree <laughs> with everything that Anne just said. Um, uh, and, but as far as a networking opportunity, I mean, that, that was, you, mm -hmm. you it's through my job at the consulate, I got to know everybody, <laughs> everybody um, sure. within the Japanese community. I mean, I, I mm -hmm. go to the airport and, you know, mm -hmm. Japanese <laughs> people from all over the, the state right. running up to me and saying hello. So, mm -hmm. um, so it's a really great opportunity to um, be able to get to meet a lot of people for networking purposes and then to use mm -hmm. that for your, your next career step later mm -hmm. on for mm -hmm. sure. Yep. Good point. 
Okay, I know we're, we're running kind of long here, but we've got all these great questions and we've got this wonderful panel. I just have having a hard time trying to cut it off anywhere. I think I'm going to, I'm going to sneak in about two more questions and then we'll start to wrap it up. Uh, so the next question is, uh, how would you recommend finding jobs in Japan or in America for someone who has an intermediate understanding of Japanese other than ALT type jobs? So other industries than just English, English teaching. Mm. I'll, I'll jump in and say that, again, intermediate, fluent, beginner, no language. I think it really is very much dependent on what kind of industry and job you're trying to get into. Um, so I, th I think research, do some research, um, go online, see what you can find. I, for example, have a bunch of uh, senpai success stories on my website. And I know that Jessica and Anthony have had their articles written. So mm -hmm. maybe reading these stories and seeing what other people have done to find mm -hmm. out exactly like what you're kind of into and what your language skills should be like. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of us on the panel, maybe we started off doing things that didn't have an N1 or N2 or anything attached, or maybe we didn't have a certain degree. Like mm -hmm. we've all been able to do something in our own way because we kind of like persevered, gambarud. So just because you think that your language skills maybe aren't like fluent or anything, I still think that that is that's not um, something that you should worry about too much. Granted, if you want to work in a Japanese setting and you're interested in having improving your Japanese language skills, then absolutely go for it. See what you can do to keep studying. As long as you're making progress, I think then that's fine. And you don't have to worry about being like, you know, the Kegel master or something. So just um, do your research, see what you think is out there, what's required. And if you are doing your research, you're like, wow, every single job I'm applying to requires an N1, well, then you have your answer, then you're going to study and you're going to take that mm -hmm. exam in December. Or if you're in Japan, I think it's in July, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's going to happen this year. So do your research and see. Yeah, and if, if I could add to that with a, a somewhat personal story that might help, I think it's important to, you know, as, as Kasha said, you know, don't think about your level. Think about, can you do the job? And then you need to look for opportunities to prove that you can mm. do the job. So when I, uh, soon after I came to Japan, my Japanese wasn't so hot, but I, I felt maybe I could translate some simple things and I was interested in that career path. So going on with our theme about networking, yeah, I went on LinkedIn. I, have, I found a job posting for a translation job and I, it was a, a Hail Mary, it was a long shot, but I contacted the hiring manager and said, you know, I'm interested in this. Can I get some more details on what it would take? Can I give a sample? And he was so kind. He actually gave me the material to be translated and said, here, here it is. Uh, this is what we're looking for. Please do this and I'll, I'll pass this to the higher ups. And uh, I had a chance to prove myself. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't good enough, but he, you know, again, this hiring manager was so gracious and he said, okay, it's not quite there yet, but keep in touch. If you're interested in other positions, let me know. So uh, really, whether it's LinkedIn or person to person, you know, don't worry about what's on paper, but just look for opportunities to, to prove what you can do and show because showing is so much more effective than telling. So build up a portfolio, reach out to people and, and get more information about these positions that you would like to pursue and anything can happen. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. We're going to start to kind of wrap it up here. Uh, we did get a couple of questions about MEXT scholarships. I know that's actually a pretty important one that I wish we could have covered just a little bit more. That information for the most part is out there online. I recommend looking for um, message boards, that kind of thing. Kasia, you're, you're nodding your head. Do you have any specific uh, insight into MEXT? Look up your local consulate and go to the page where they talk about the MEXT scholarship and they will tell you everything you need to know. Look at the previous years, see when the application process, what it looks like when it's due. The MEXT is, is kind of, you have to really do a little bit of research, you gotta find a professor, you gotta do things for it. It's not something that you can read now and submit it next week. So see what it looked like last year, plan for it and your local consulate, wherever it is, is going to have that information. Great, thank you. Um, and then the other sort of question that I'm seeing pop up quite a bit is uh, questions about how to maintain your Japanese if you're no, no longer in classes or uh, maybe not, not in the classroom studying Japanese or maybe no longer living in Japan, a handful of different questions like that. 
Um, that's gonna that's going to uh, segue us into the uh, into the drawing the, the the door prize in just a second. But before we do that, does anybody have any insight about uh, maintaining your level of Japanese language skills? Uh, maybe when you've lost your opportunity in a classroom or in Japan to use it. I'll jump in because I've been studying Japanese for 35 years. I still don't say I'm fluent. And of course, in Japan, we can never say we're fluent or Jozu, right? But um, I've had that particular challenge. So one, marry somebody else who speaks Japanese. <laughs> if that doesn't work, uh, or if that's not an option, uh, there are, like I said, tons of meetup.com and other uh, conversation groups. I routinely volunteer at my alma mater. They have these conversation groups and the freshmen are so cute. I mean, they're making all the same mistakes you made, right? And they're like, oh, that used to be me. Um, it's a lot of fun. You can also, I highly recommend, make friends with Japanese people. There are so many all over where we are living and they will talk to you in Japanese most of the time. So um, those kind of things, and again, volunteering. I know students at a university or the recent graduates, they volunteer at our Japanese Saturday school you know, and they learn it's an immersion environment because the thousand kids who show up on Saturday, they're all speaking Japanese, as are their parents. So um, I think there's lots of opportunities. You just have to go out and find it. And uh, there's a lot of uh, software out there that can help you get in touch with Japanese people. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, the internet is, is uh, you know, such a great resource for getting in touch mm -hmm. with Japanese people across the, across the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those platforms uh, is called Sail. Uh, Shingo Ono is here representing SAIL. He'd like to speak just a little bit about what it is, and then we're going to give out um, one month memberships to five lucky individuals. So, Ono-san, お願いします。ありがとうございます。大野です。あの、私からは日本語で話をさせてもらいたいと思います。はい。で、私はこのセイルというプラットフォームの担当者です。で、少しスクリーンをシェアして、え、ありがとうございました。今の動画見えましたか？大丈夫ですか？ありがとうございます。あの、私たちはあの本当にシンプルなそしてユニークなプラットフォームを用意しています。日本人と日本語を学ぶ皆様が日本語でコミュニケーションを
。で、えー、シニアの日本人、日本人のシニアは、えー、日本について詳しくて、非常に経験値が、えー、たくさんあります。日本に詳しいです。歴史について詳しいです。そういった人たちとたくさんお話をすることで、たくさんコミュニケーションをすることで日本について知っていただきたいなと思っています。で、私たちのプラットフォームには今、120、120の国からの参加があります。また、日本人はですね、今では8000人登録してきていて、どんどんどんどん増えています。非常にシンプルなアプリケーションでして、このアプリケーションで日本人とマッチングしていただいて、えー、お話をしていただきます、はいで。私たち非常に注目していただきまして、えー、日本のテレビ、えー、NHK とか、日本のニュースペーパーの日本経済新聞とか、さまざまなメディアで取り上げていただいています。はい、ぜひあの、このプレゼントを受け取ってもらって、あと、えー、このセールでたくさんお話しして、えー、もらえたらなと思ってます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございました。Okay, so that's the, the basic platform. And now we're going to、uh, choose numbers at random to give、uh, one month memberships for free to five lucky individuals. So,、uh, Yume and Samantha, would you please、uh, take it away with finding our lucky, fee, our, our lucky individuals? Yes. Okay. Can you mean? Okay, so I have this app、uh, that automatically c h o o s e five people, five numbers, five individuals. So let's try. <laughs> And after this, we'll send you an email with instructions on how you can get your free one month membership to sale. Okay, Sam,、so、I'm, I'm going to、uh, call the number. All right, one、If、at a time. If the person's here,、um, Okay, one at a time. Okay, number five. Oh, number five. Okay, so we, that would be、um, Yuki Hirosawa. Are you still here, Yuki? Can you unmute yourself so you can let us know if you're here? Yes. Yay. <laughs> Congratulations, yes, thank Yuki san. <laughs> thank you so、And、much for joining number, us. <laughs> all right. And then next, number 17. 17. One moment, please. Wish we could get like a drum roll sound effect here for this. Let's see here.、Uh, 17. <laughs>、um, Corinne Davis. And I know Corinne sent, I think, a few、um, questions to us as well. Corinne, are you still here? Yes, I'm here. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for the great panel. And then next is number 16,、uh, 66. 66. 66. 66は、um, Hannah Voter. Are you here, Hannah? I'm here. Yay, congratulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we have、And、two more still. Two more lucky persons is、um, 28, number 28. Number 28.、Uh, Graham Lawrence. Graham Lawrence, are you here? If you're here, please unmute yourself. But I don't know if I see him in the chat anymore. One moment. I think it was、uh, oh, after midnight.、Great. I don't think he's here anymore. Oh, no. Okay. I, I do see him in the participants list, but maybe.、Um, Graham, oh. oh. I am, Kasia. I am still、Yay! here. Oh, just finding the button. <laughs> Great. Congratulations. Thank you for the discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, last one, I think, Yume. Last lucky person is number 37. 37. So that would be Zach, Zach R. Are you, are you still in the、um, discussion here, Zach? Let's see. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if I see him here in the chat anymore.、Um, one last chance, Zach, if you, are,、um, if you are here, please unmute yourself.、Um, oh, all right.、Um, let's try one more number then, you may. Just one more. All right. One more time. One more time. I'm going to one by one. Sanju.、Oh. <laughs> 
30. Yes, uh, Shannon Farah. Shannon Farah, are you here? Let's see. Checking my Her list. name shows up. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Hello. Hello, oh. Shannon. Hi. Congratulations. Sorry. Not Congratulations. a problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Congratulations. All right. Thank you all for putting on such a great program. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for joining Happy us. to. Yeah. And uh, I think that is it for our um our door prizes for today. So thank you again. And I'll pass things back to Nick. Uh sorry, Gabe. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, our lucky winners, you can expect to get an email from us and we'll tell you how to get uh, started with your one month free uh, free membership on, on sale. But uh, yeah, we recommend everybody give it a try. I think you can do a couple of uh, free free trial conversations uh, if you if you go on there and try. So uh, we recommend it because yeah, the best way to, uh, to keep your Japanese is to speak Japanese. That's uh, my number one recommendation, just mm -hmm. speak it. I, I feel like a lot of people get in their heads about how to like, oh, how do I study? How do I do this? Mm -hmm. Speak it, conversations, mm -hmm. make friends. That's the most fun way to do it anyway. True. Anyway, so let's go ahead and wrap it up. Um, I think the last thing we want to do is allow our panelists to uh, tell everybody where they can find them on uh, social media or anything else that they'd like to uh, mention right now. So Jessica, would you like to mention how, how people can find you? Sure. Um, I think that the link to my um, social media, um, to sorry, to LinkedIn profile was shared in the chat before, but yes, mm -hmm. please feel free to connect um, with me and I would love to hear from you individually and I'd love to help you any way that I can. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jessica. And do you have anything you want to plug or, or mention? Uh well, I'm also listed in the um, chat here and Hinoki Foundation, we are always, you know, interested in looking for volunteers. The one thing I do want to mention is I think we have particular uh, expertise and advice to lend you if you are interested in raising bilingual children. Most of us know that studying Japanese takes a long time and uh, from personal experience and other, I've learned that when you train kids from age zero, it does go a lot faster. My children are now better at Japanese than I am in many ways. So uh, if you're interested, we're happy to share that. And Anthony, anything from you? Sure, uh, all my social links, all the ways to reach out to me are on consultsaga.com. However, I'm just gonna be honest, I'm on LinkedIn more than anything else. So if you follow Kasia's advice and connect to me and send a message saying that you were here and you, you have some questions, I would be happy to help. Um, give me some time if a lot of emails and things come in, but I would love to hear from you, thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony. And finally, Kasia, who uh, we learned was uh, hesitant in getting into social media, but now is using it like a pro. It's true. If I can do it, anybody can do it. So <laughs> um, last message is to really, honestly, if you have a dream, I know it sounds corny, but really have your dreams, go after it one step at a time. And I promise you, if you try, you will get there. So good luck. And hopefully you can um, get in touch with us. Uh, find me on LinkedIn, send a message with your LinkedIn connection request, and I'll be very happy to connect with you. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming. This is exciting. Thank you, Kasha. And thanks once again to this amazing panel. I, I can't believe it was an absolute privilege for Laurasian Institution <laughs> to be able to put this together and host the you know the amazing, amazing panel that we had today. So thank you again for, for joining us and sharing all of your thank wisdom. Thank you for having us. Uh, the final thing I want to mention is that uh, we, Laurasian Institution, are also uh, continuing to do uh, programming such as this. Uh, we've talked a lot about networking and, uh, and that kind of thing. We do uh, Laurasian Institution Presents events free about once per month. Uh, if you find us on our social media, you can also find out uh, all the latest updates about what kind of events we're doing. We do networking events. We do information about uh, Japanese cultural and language matters. We've done a, a presentation on the history of green tea in Japan. We did a, uh, mm -hmm. a sort of a film analysis on the films of uh, Ghibli and Makoto Shinkai. Mm -hmm. uh, we do all sorts of fun stuff and uh, we wanna get in touch with you. Uh, if you get in touch with us and, and uh, tell us what kind of programming you're interested in, maybe you could maybe see something like that featured on one of these future uh, uh, Laurasian Institution Presents events. Uh, next month is going to be an event with the uh, hosts of the Culture Crossings podcast. Um, they'll be talking about being globally mobile in your personal and professional life. Uh, they're going to speak about navigating cross-cultural work conditions, but also about finding your own personality in a cross-cultural context. Mm -hmm. Should be very interesting. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, and actually, so the door prize in that event is going to be uh, five individuals mm -hmm. will receive access to one of Ikigai Connections course modules. Uh, they have an online training program for the bilingual job search. So if you're interested in kind of what Kasia was talking about today, you might be able to get uh, free access to, to some of their information on the website if you come to our event next month. So follow us on social media and uh, yeah, we'll look forward to seeing you in the future with more Japanese language and cultural programming. Thank you very much and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.